and 6. And then we'll read the text that comes with this commandment. Question answer 106. But does this commandment speak only of killing? By forbidding murder, God teaches us that he hates the root of murder, such as envy, hatred, anger, and desire of revenge, and that he regards all these as murder. Actually, we should read 107 as well. Is it enough, then, that we do not kill our neighbor in any such way? No. When God condemns envy, hatred, and anger, he commands us to love our neighbor as ourselves, to show patience, peace, gentleness, mercy, and friendliness toward him, and to protect him from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. We can now turn to 1 Samuel 24. This, of course, is the famous passage where David spares Saul's life. 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave, and he called after Saul, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord ju- avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog, after a flea? May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now, behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. 
Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. That's part of the reading of Scripture. Brothers and sisters, I wonder if you've ever read the proverb of Solomon, Proverbs 25, verse 22. If your enemy is thirsty, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. Or perhaps you've heard the famous teaching of Jesus. You've heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. And I wonder what we really think of this. I mean, we all know this teaching. We've heard it before. Even those who aren't Christian know this teaching and sometimes even try to live it. But do we really get it? Is Jesus for real? Sometimes I think we wonder if there's a catch somewhere in this. I mean, this really isn't a sustainable way to live, is it? In fact, those, many of those who don't know Jesus, they see this command as ludicrous. It seems like a path to love your enemies seems like the path to weakness. Nobody wants to be weak. Many of us, I think deep down, we look for ways to circumvent this teaching. Or try to explain it away as if Jesus didn't really mean it. Or we intellectualize it away. And yet, when Jesus gives this command, there's no indication whatsoever that there's a back door or a catch. He means what he says. Now, if that's true, we better figure out what exactly it means to love your enemies. And that's what we're going to do today. Because the good news here is that the Bible gives us examples of people who actually did love their enemy. One of these examples is in this chapter in 1 Samuel. David spares Saul's life. And today we're going to look at that example and see how it illustrates the teaching of Jesus and serves as an example for us. And so we'll see that David loves his enemy. And we'll start by looking at the first verses of 1 Samuel 24, where here you have Saul returning from following the Philistines. He's told that David is in the wilderness of En Gedi, which is near the Dead Sea. Why is that good news for Saul? Well, David has been running from Saul for some time, because Saul wants to kill David, because Saul has realized that David is going to be king after him. Saul does not want that. He wants his sons to be king after him. And Saul, of course, arrives in En Gedi with 3,000 men. He comes to the sheepfolds where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. And the drama begins when David and his men are in the back of the cave. And this, especially according to Saul's men, seems like a stroke of good fortune for David. Saul, the source of all David's suffering, David's sworn enemy, and a man who appears to be the enemy of God. Here he is, vulnerable to attack. I mean, if David, if the roles were reversed, wouldn't Saul kill David? And that's why David's men say in verse 4, And the men of David say to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I shall give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Apparently there's been some prophecy from a prophet that says that Saul will be given into David's hand. And we don't even know if the prophecy is true, but nonetheless, his men think it is. The first, it seems that David agrees with his men. Clearly this is a providential opportunity to kill his enemy. So David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Which, hold on a second. You can only imagine the shock of David's men. Here he is, he's 
Saul is vulnerable, and all David does is cut off a corner of his robe. And not only that, look at afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner. David is conscience stricken for cutting off the corner of Saul's robe. It's the most bizarre way of thinking. Now, first of all, cutting off a corner of Saul's robe is highly symbolic. God had commanded all Israelites to have tassels sewn on the corner of their garments. And of course, if a tassel was on the corner of a royal garment, then to cut it off meant that the king, Saul, did not have the Lord's protection or the Lord's support, so to speak, and that the kingdom belonged to someone different. So symbolically, David has done something significant. There's a a powerful symbol in this. But David regrets his presumption. And here's where we begin to realize there's more going on. Yes, God had said that David would be king, but God had not said that David would be king now. God had not said that Saul would stop being king or that David could destroy Saul. God had not given David the permission to take the kingdom by force. And David comments on this in the next verses. He says, verse 6, He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. David rebukes his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. Now, I sense that we still wonder about this, and we'll talk more about this in a bit in the second point. But first we should notice that as the chapter goes on, this is not the end of the matter. David engages in the biblical practice of heaping coals on his enemy. How? And what does it mean to heap coals on someone's head? Well, to heap coals on someone's head is to show them kindness even though they mean to do you harm. And by showing them kindness, you will produce shame in them. And turn, hopefully, turn their heart. And that's what David does here. David does something in this chapter that's extremely dangerous. He walks out of the cave and confronts Saul. He gives this long speech about how, he, how loyal he has been to Saul, how much he cares for Saul, how he does not want this conflict to go on, and how he cares about Saul. And in that speech, he clearly states the evil of what Saul is doing. He does not let Saul off the hook, nor does he just forgive him. No. He actually even says, he says, I will not take judgment against you, Saul, but God might and God will. It's a remarkable thing. He he, he kind of almost in a sense... On the one hand, he calls judgment on Saul, but then on the other hand, he calls for Saul to change. And the climax of it is in verse 13, where it says, as the proverb of the ancients says, out of the wicked comes wickedness. And he says, may the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not. And then out of the wicked comes wickedness. And the same word is used twice. Out of the wicked person's heart, in a sense, comes wicked deeds. And this is David's way of saying, Listen, Saul, look at my actions. My actions tell you about the state of my heart. And your actions tell you about the state of your heart. Saul, I didn't kill you because my heart is not black like yours. And by so doing, brothers and sisters, what David does is he preaches the gospel to Saul. He, sh- he, he cuts right to the heart of the matter. He says, Saul, my heart is different than yours and you should think about why that might be. So 
Saul, my heart is filled with God, and I am obedient to God. You are not. And you, that is what you need to reflect on, Saul. And this, of course, shames Saul. Saul weeps aloud. This has such a powerful effect on him that he weeps and he lets David go. He says, you know, what does he say? You are more righteous than I. You have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And Saul's madness subsides and he returns home. However, it's not over as Saul returns again to attack David. His heart is still wicked and his evilness returns. Now, this is our second point. I've chosen to go through this passage by going through the passage and now to think about what we learn from the passage. The reason is because it's hard to talk about the application of this passage without reading the whole thing. There's a few things I want to work through in the sense of what, what is, why is this significant for us today? And the first one is this. First, it's important to note how easily David's men considered evil God's will. It's shocking how easily David's men jumped to the conclusion that doing Killing Saul, murdering Saul, is the right thing to do. Why did Saul's men want David to kill Saul? Especially in such a cold-blooded way. Well, they were, Saul's men, let's not forget, were wandering around the desert. They were living day by day. They did not necessarily have enough food to eat. They were living in caves which were cold and damp. It was not a nice life. And here they saw an opportunity to end their suffering. And actually, there's more than that. They had also seen Saul kill 70 priests. This is a classic, would you kill, would you murder Hitler if you could situation. Why not simply kill the evil man and do away with it? Now, the difference between Hitler and Saul is that God... God specifically put Saul in charge of Israel. That is different. And so how easily human beings convince themselves that doing something evil is right. And I wonder if we as Reformed believers need to think about this too. How easy is it for you and I to twist God's words and ethics in Scripture to suit our own objectives? Just because we sit in a Reformed church doesn't mean we don't do this. I mean, sure, we formally hold to the authority of Scripture and to the confessions, but in the way we live our lives, do we? Are you, are you biblical in your life of doctrine? Do you, do, you, do you know? Have you checked? When you have a particular issue in your life, do you search out the Scriptures to see what they say? Or do you assume God is on your side just because you're reformed? I find COVID instructive in this matter. How many of us on all sides of the COVID debate easily assume God implicitly supports our opinions on the matter? It's it's rather odd that, at least in my mind, that those of us with the most confidence in our COVID opinions on all sides are those who've usually spent the least time searching Scripture and praying about the matter. Here's an example. How often have I heard people advocate the direct opposite of Romans 13? And then the defense. Oh, people who submit to the government don't have a fully developed biblical worldview. In other words, the passage doesn't really mean what it says if you read it in context. Never mind that the context is Romans 12, which says that we should love our enemies. Is it a coincidence that Romans 13 is after Romans 12? I don't think so. But it's inconvenient, you see, to submit to the authorities because submission requires suffering. And the North American Christian is allergic to suffering of any kind. It's perhaps our greatest problem. 
Now, that's not to say that the other side is always better. Some of us are willing to follow the government to the gates of hell because we don't like conflict. But David's situation is interesting. On the one hand, David is running from Saul. Saul is the government. Is David obeying the government? No, he is not. David disobeys the government in his situation. He does not obey Saul because to do so would be to to allow Saul to murder him. It would be to enable Saul's sin. Now even so, what's fascinating about David's disobedience is that he does not repay Saul's evil with more evil. No, in fact, David works very hard to show Saul that he wants to obey. In fact, he even preaches the gospel to Saul and he preaches a little bit of vengeance. He shows Saul, he says, Saul, listen, the results of your actions are not going to end well. God may take vengeance against you. But he does throughout express his love for Saul and how much he cares for Saul. He does not want any conflict or evil. And he responds to Saul's evil with love. And I wonder if that's perhaps the pattern for today. We want the best for the government too. We want to submit. We may not be able to in all instances, but we want to. And more than anything, we want to love the government and those who work in it. And if the day comes that we must disobey, it will grieve us. It will not be something that we celebrate. If David could do all of this with Saul, who was far worse than Doug Forder or Justin Trudeau, then we ought to do the same today. So secondly, what does it even mean to love our enemy anyway? Now consider Jesus' command in Matthew 5, echoed in Romans 12, of course. Where Jesus says, he says, love your enemies. And he gives some further instruction. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. So no, don't curse your enemies. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Right, and this is in Romans now. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I don't... I mean, maybe you can correct me later, but I don't see a back door here again, as I mentioned earlier. There's no escape hatch. Now you might ask, well, why? what do you mean? You mean Jesus says it means what he says here? How can we live this way? Let me tell you something. This is exactly what Jesus did when he lived on earth. A Christian is nothing if not an imitator of Christ. Jesus never spoke back when The Jewish leaders insulted him and slapped him and flogged him. He definitely called them evil, though, at times. But when the end came, he never repaid evil with evil. He called evil evil, yes. But never, despite the hours of agony that he survived at the end of his life, did Jesus ever let hatred and resentment build up in his heart. Never which sounds almost impossible for us to believe, us who can call ourselves resentment generators. In fact, on the cross he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It doesn't mean he actually did forgive those who hurt him. It meant that he wanted to. As many of them did not repent. And if nothing else, this should show us that Jesus is nothing like us, because who of us could have done such a thing? And if Jesus would have responded with evil to the evil that was being done, with any sort of force or anger, he would have become the same as his opponents, and he would have immediately lost everything. Jesus, you see, didn't come just to destroy our enemies, but to destroy the whole concept of conflict and enmity itself. 
That's why he's the Prince of Peace and Reconciliation. And it's interesting, the Sikhs talk about this in the Sikh religion. They have a proverb that says, fighting destroys the enemy, kindness destroys enmity itself. Now, of course, um, much of the enmity, the conflict that does exist in the world is created by people who, like the devil, who will never stop. And the only way to end enmity is to destroy the devil. That will happen too. But the point is that when Christ lived on earth, he lived in such a way that he never repaid evil for evil. And even if he had, he would have had a right to do so because God is the one to whom vengeance must be left. He is the perfect judge. But while Jesus lived on earth, he did not do that because he lived as one of us. Now, if David, third, if David could love his enemies, then that would mean that so can you. I mean, it's hard, sometimes it's hard, oh, Jesus did it, oh, can I do it, but he's God, I'm not. But in this passage we read that David did. And David's astonishing ability to love his enemy shows that Jesus does not keep his power to himself, but gives, that God gives power through the Holy Spirit to his people so that they live like him. And if God gave David the ability to love his enemies, then that means you can do it too. David, like us, has a transformed heart. That's why he says, right, from, from wickedness, or what does it say here? From wicked, out of the wicked comes wickedness. In other words, my heart is not wicked. One author described what David might have said to his men in the cave. Something like this. Better he kill me than I learn his ways. Better he kill me than I become as he is. I shall not practice the ways that cause kings to go mad. I will not throw spears. I will not allow hatred to grow in my heart. I will not avenge. I will not destroy the world. The Lord's anointed not now, not ever. Better he kill me than I learn his ways. I think this shows us that David has what I would call a beatitude heart. You see, it's not that David is a superhuman person that lived in a way that you and I can never attain. No, David is a real historical person just like you and I. He had real failures. In fact, bigger failures than almost all of us can say that we've had. It's not that David never does murderous things. He does. The point is that God is shaping David's heart through the Holy Spirit to be something that's filled with his own power. This is where it's a mistake to look at the Old Testament as only what God's doing. No. The Old Testament is the stories of people like you who lived with God in relationship with God and did difficult things or, and failed and all these things. And you are part of this. And what's fascinating about David's life is that God uses the evil of Saul to produce good in David's heart. He, it shapes David. David spends years in the desert fleeing before he becomes king. Those years in the desert shape his character and they humble him. It's after he's king for a number of years that he, that he kills Uriah and sleeps with Bathsheba. He's forgotten the desert by that time. And perhaps the difficult things, perhaps the evil people in your life, perhaps those who afflict you and persecute you, God is allowing that precisely so that he can produce good in your life. You can guarantee that that is not happening if you decide to murder your opponent. Or if you want to destroy them. Then you've learned nothing. So fourth, Why would we love our enemies when it seems so counterproductive? Contrary to popular opinion, loving your enemies is actually the most powerful way, the most powerful response to their evil. Martin Luther King Jr. once spoke about this. He said, you know, loving our enemies is the only way to truly prevail. And we don't always agree with everything Martin Luther King Jr. said, but 
He was right on this. And he said, there are three reasons why you have to love your enemies. Otherwise, your culture will be destroyed. He said, listen, if you don't love your enemies, then you must necessarily hate them. And even a pure just ignorance or coldness towards them is a type of hate. And if two enemies continue to hate each other, then the conflict between them will never end until one or both are destroyed. And chances are it will destroy both. And King argues as proof of this is that out of 21 major world civilizations, only seven have survived history. And a major reason for the destruction of the civilizations that haven't continued is because those civilizations had no forgiveness. They had no ability to stop the cycle of revenge. And revenge between the, the conflicts and revenge between the major dominant families eventually destroyed the whole civilization. You can think of Assyria as a classic example of that. Where the children were killing their parents and the children were killing each other until foreign enemies came in and destroyed the whole thing. The failure to forgive becomes the end of an entire civilization. You see, these things matter. Number two, King says that if you hate your enemy, it will destroy your own soul. Hate distorts a person's personality and their desires. Saul is exhibit A in that. Hate destroys Saul. It makes him mad. And if you don't love your enemy and instead harbor hate and resentment against them, you are the one who will pay most. Number three, King says there is a redemptive power in love. Showing love redeems people. It has the power to reach the most scabbed and hard and broken of souls, if, to show a person love, even in the midst of when they've done great evil to you. It breaks through the, the noise. Think of Jean Valjean in Le Miserable as an example of that. There's the famous scene where Jean Valjean is taken in by the bishop or the priest. And he steals the, the candlesticks, the silver candlesticks, and runs away. And of course, he's caught. He's brought back to the priest's house, or the, I think it's the bishop. And the bishop says, oh, no, I gave them to him. And by so doing, Jean Valjean keeps the, the, the candlesticks and avoids going to, back to jail, which is where he was. He, of course, was the most hardened of all convicts. Jean Valjean, this stunning act of love from the bishop, it, 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 it's like a rock in his shoe. He, 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 he can't shake it. He can't ignore it. He walks down the path out of the town and eventually he, he steals another coin from a little boy, but it's just too much. It cracks his soul. The most hardened of conflict, or sorry, the most hardened of convicts is changed by the love of the bishop. And I believe that one of the most, and I, I can't say this 100% for sure, but I believe it. it's true. But this is one of the major reasons why David spared Saul in the cave. David wanted to reach Saul's soul. That's why David leaves the cave. He risks his life for the soul of Saul. He wanted Saul to repent and turn to God. He didn't want to destroy Saul. He loved Saul and he loved Saul's son. He lived in Saul's house. He married Saul's daughter. He was best friends with Saul's son. He wanted Saul to change. He thought, oh, if I can just tell him, maybe he will. It broke David's heart to see the decline of Saul. So David risks his life to bring Saul back. No person, you see, is beyond the threshold of the gospel. No person is beyond the reach of love and kindness. It's one of the lessons of Christ. Now Saul, of course, doesn't change. Although he does feel great remorse in the moment. It's a very powerful thing. And again, this is just it. Some of us think that loving our enemies means we permit their actions. That's not true. Our love for them demands that we tell the truth about their evil. In fact, the Forgiveness, which is not quite the same thing, but 
To forgive someone is to name their evil and then say, you know what, I'm going to leave the vengeance to God and I, I am going to forgive you. Forgiveness demands that we recognize and admit evil. And we're never happy about injustice or permissive of it. That's not what love is. What's different about those who follow Jesus and loving their enemies is our means of change. Instead of destroying your enemies and domination, we love them. We persuade them with our love. We aren't interested in just changing your behavior or stopping people from doing something. We want their soul. And love is the way to do that. Why? Because that's how Jesus redeems your soul. 1 John 4, verse 10. This is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. You see, Jesus doesn't bring you into the kingdom by clubbing you into submission. He doesn't mock us if we don't agree with him. He doesn't throw gravel at us when we make a decision that we don't like, that he doesn't like. No. Jesus initiates his relationship with you by allowing himself to be whipped and flogged and have nails pounded through his hands. And while those things happened, he implored the Father to forgive those who did those very things. That's what your Savior did. That's how he starts with you. If that's how he started his relationship with you, you can imagine what he does for the rest of his relationship with you. He gave up the whole world for you. Remember, Satan offered him the whole world. He said, no. Because he didn't just want to be king over this world. He wanted to be king over your heart. So, when you read our passage today, do not so quickly assume that you would do what the hero did. We always assume that we would do what the good characters did. I suspect that most of us are probably more with David's men than David in this chapter. And so that means that this passage is a prompt to self-examination. Would you do what David did? Because if you're confused about why David did what he did, then you might. How can I tell if I would have done what David did? Well, who are your opponents today? Who do you hate? Who do you consider as the greatest enemy of your faith? Or just of you in general? You probably have people like that at home or at church or on Facebook, at work, the government. Think about the people you can't stand, the people that you think are the enemy of everything that you like. Ask yourself the question, how are you planning to treat them in the future? What's your strategy for reconciliation? And if your strategy is to ignore them or to never talk to them again or to influence others to now hate them as well, then you would never have done what David did, nor are you doing what Jesus would have done. No, because what Jesus would have done is act with grace in love and self-sacrifice and truth. He never shirked away from telling the truth about someone. But choose carefully, you see. Are you going to use force or gossip or malicious words or ignorance or against your opponents or grace and love and the open hand of love? Choose carefully. Because one strategy comes from Christ, the other one comes from the devil. And whichever one you embrace may point you to where your heart has been all along. So brothers and sisters, if that is you, repent and return to Jesus. Go to him because he will show you the way and he will show you what you need and he will give you everything you need to love even those you thought you could never love. And in so doing, you will experience the grace of Christ yourself 
and you will be filled with the most beautiful joy. Amen. Let us